All right, welcome to data visualization using R. Um, there are four instructors here, so you have a great student teacher ratio. <laughs> we have, I'm Sarah Mannheimer, I'm the data librarian here in the library. Um, Ava London. Yes, yeah, I'm Ava, I'm an undergraduate assistant. Yeah. Sally? Uh, I'm Sally Slifer. I'm a research statistician. Um, so I use a lot of this in my day to day. Um, Yep. And then Greta and Nina. I am the facility manager of social data collection and analysis services, um, social data for short. Um, and um, I'm also, I have a site um, research statistician um, project that I'm also working on and I'm uh, working with a PhD in statistics. Ooh, a lot. A lot. <laughs> Um, so all of us are here to help you. If you have any questions, just raise your hand, then one of us will come help you. And we also have some attendees online. So if you're online, um, use the chat and one of us will be monitoring the chat uh, if you have any questions. So today's workshop, we're using this online tutorial. Um, the goal is to produce different kinds of plots using ggplot2, which is a package, an R package. We will set universal and local plot settings. We'll describe what aesthetics are and then how we use them. We'll describe what faceting is and apply faceting, modify the aesthetics of an existing plot, build multivariate and customized plot from data, and we'll arrange multiple plots in a grid format, and then we'll learn to export all of your plots for publication. And let's just talk about the, how to use the tutorial. So you all have this URL, rconnect.math.edu slash data viz tutorial. You have to type it out exactly like that. Um, this is, we made this tutorial using Shiny, which is an R package. And so it's an interactive tutorial. It has these sandboxes that you'll see that you can type code into and that will run. So everything is working in the background, um, but it just makes it so that you don't have to like set up our studio on your own computer and work with that. This is more of an advanced workshop, assuming you already know how to use our studio and now we're just working with the code itself. And so you'll be able to run code as you would in our studio. And we also have a few challenges that have answers that you can click. So it's kind of like a fun interactive way to do this um, without needing to use the software. Um, I think that's it. Um, I'll say this at the end, but there are additional recordings available at this URL that you can access through the through the tutorial. Great. Is this me or are you, this is me still, right? Okay, so let's talk in, we'll introduce you to DataViz in general and ggplot. ggplot is a package of R. You're all familiar with a packet, a packages in R, great. And so it provides a more programmatic interface than just the basic R. It allows you to plot, um, display variables differently and create other general visual properties. And so, um, it just helps make plots look better and helps you more help simplify the code for creating these plots. Um, with here, it just explains what packages are additional functions that let you do more stuff. And so in the previous workshop, I don't think any of you were here, but we did talk about, um, some functions that come built into R. Um, and so ggplot is part of the tidyverse package that doesn't come built into R, so you need to install the tidyverse, and this is an umbrella package that includes tidyr, dplyr, ggplot, readr, warcats, and many others. And so tidyverse is basically just trying to solve problems that arise with some of the like base R functions as this quote says, no matter how complex and polished the individual operations are, it is often the quality of the glue that mostly determines the power of the system. So that's what Tidyverse is trying to do. It's written for more reading. Um, and so in this tutorial, we've already um, installed Tidyverse. So that's running behind the scenes. 
if you were to try and do this work on your own R Studio instance, you would use install packages, tidyverse, um, and then you would load the library using library and tidyverse. And if you need more info about using packages, we have more of that in our intro to R uh, workshop, which there's a video of online. And then and we also provide some links here with cheat sheets and references if you want more information about ggplot now or later. So let's get into it. So the data we're using today is a survey of a small mammal community in Southern Arizona. So you'll see it's part of a project that studies the effects of rodents and ants on the plant community. It's been going for 40 years and it's real data. So it's historical data, but real, which is kind of cool. We're focusing on the years 1996 to 02. And so basically they set out little plots and tracked the rodents that ran across each plot of land. And so you'll see we simplified the data set a little bit, but the data set has these different variables, record ID, month, day, year, plot ID of the particular plot, the species of rodent that ran through the plot, the sex of the rodent, the hind foot length, I guess that's like a way of measuring the size of the rodent, and then the weight. So all of these we're gonna be working with and plotting in our workshop today. And so we will read in the data first using the read underscore CSV function, which is part of the tidyverse. Um, so we'll use that instead of read.csv, which is a base R function. So it just functions a little differently and works better in the tidyverse. So there, this is, um, so in this tutorial, you can click run code, or you can also use the control enter um, as you would in our studio. And if you need to start over, click there. And then there's also something, I thought there was something at the bottom. Oh yeah, if you click here, you can start the entire tutorial over, but we won't need to do that until the end. So there we go, we've read the code in, and you can see there, what, I don't know why the message isn't showing, but it would say parsed with column specification, followed by each column name and data type. Um, when you use this read underscore CSV, it looks through the first thousand rows of each column and then it guesses the data type for each column and reads it into R. So it reads weight as a numeric data type and species as a character data, data type. So we can inspect the data by pressing control enter or running the code. And then you can see it's like showing up the, the result of that code is showing up here. So you can see just a little preview of the data. Some of the first few values in each of these variables, each of these columns, and then also the data type that R has assumed that each of these columns is. Then if you use view, you can see it in more of a table format. Some of the years, records ID, sex, nine foot length, weight, etc. And then you'll notice at the top of the output, it says the data class is a tibble. Where is that? Up here, maybe? I can't find it right now, but trust me, it is. <laughs> and so tibbles tweak some of the behaviors of a data frame, but they're basically a data frame in the tidyverse. Um, the only differences are that it only prints the first few rows of data and only as many columns as will fit on one screen. And the columns of class character are never converted into factors, which we talk about in a data wrangling, the an upcoming workshop. But for now, it's not really relevant. All you need to know is you've got this data here and it's read it in, and so we'll be able to work with it. All right, who's next, Sally? Okay, um, so I'm gonna walk you guys through getting started making plots, and then it'll slowly get more complicated. Um, so, um, using ggplot, it's part of the tidyverse, um, and so 
Uh, it works really well with other tidyverse packages and when you're working in the long data format. So that just means that um, every column is a variable, every row is an observation. Um, yeah, data wrangling, we get more into different types of formats like wide format and all that. Uh, so yeah, if you have every row as an observation, it's working on plotting every row of data. Um, and if you have your data set really well formatted like this, it makes it a lot easier to work it into ggplot and change things and plot things. Um, and so with ggplot, the basic format to build any plot is gonna start with the function, um, ggplot, parentheses. There's a data parameter where you give it your data frame, um, a mapping parameter where you give it different variables you want to plot, um, and then you add geomes. Um, and so there's a ton of different geomes that you can use. Um, and this is what makes the points um, or the visualization on the plot. Um, so we'll go through each of these. Um, so we start with ggplot and then our data and we have our survey data here. Um, so we'll just run that. Oh, I was waiting for it. So it creates a blank plot. It doesn't do anything yet, but it basically maps um, or attaches this data set to uh, ggplot so it knows it's working with everything that's in this data. And so it sets up kind of this blank layer. Um, and then from there, we have to tell it what from the data set we want to be in the plot. So we have uh, a mapping parameter and Using ggplot, anything that is a variable that has different values that change throughout the plot, um, we put inside this uh, aesthetic um, AES function. Um, so we give it an X variable and a Y variable. Um, and so these are two, um, we've got weight and hind foot length, um, which are both quantitative. So we'll tell it those variables. And if we run this, now it adds this layer on top of our um, blank data layer where it now knows we're working with these two variables and the general scale of those. So you can see the axes appear. Um, and then from there we add geomes. Um, so these are the graphical representations um, and there's a lot of different options. There's um, uh, geom point for scatter plots, um, geom box plot for box plots, uh, bar for bar charts, line for trend lines, um, and time series, things like that. There's also a ton more, and earlier in um, this uh, document, there's a link to a ggplot cheat sheet, which I use quite a lot because it gives you all these different options. Um, you can look up the help file for a ggplot or the cheat sheet gives you a lot of ideas of um, what types of geomes might be good for the data that you have. Um, and after we give it the ggplot with the data and the mapping, we start adding layers on with this plus sign. Um, so that's where we add our geome. Um, and so we're gonna start with geome point to make a scatter plot. Um, and so it has the data and the variable. So now we just tell it that we want this type of visualization. Oops, I just highlighted one. Okay, so run that all together. Um, and so now it adds the points on, on a new layer on top of the axes. Um, so those are all of our points. Um, so the plus sign is just like adding layers and you can add a, many layers. Um, and the syntax of this is interesting because it needs to be at the end of the previous line. So like here, it's the, at the end of our ggplot data and mapping. Um, if we accidentally put it at the beginning, uh, it gives us an error. So here we have at the beginning of the line and it tells us it can't do that. Um, did you accidentally put it on a new line? Yes, we did. Um, so we can just change that to get it to run. And this goes on any line, um, which helps keep it organized too. And now that runs. Okay, and like I said, this is like an iterative process. So we just add one thing at a time. We give it data, variables, 
points, and then we can start adding more things. Um, there's other characteristics we can add to the plot. Um, so we're starting with the same plot that we just made. And um, now we're going to add something like um, in alpha, which is the opacity of um, whatever graphic you're displaying. So we're going to put alpha equals 0.2 under the geom point. And so there's a question. Maybe yes. Um, so the parenthesis mm -hmm. for this. This starts from the data survey and then mm -hmm. identify the data and x and y axis is like one chunk. Uh, yes. Okay. The things are separate. Yes. So these are on different lines because it can get bulky with all of this on here. But basically, you just it's sort of just this one line where you've got your ggplot function where you give it data and your mappings. Um, and then this AES function is just to tell ggplot that these are variables instead of like constants. Um, so once you've got this ggplot function set up, then you start adding things to it. So that's where you add um, your geom point and other geoms. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, it's not inside the like the first parameter. Right, this alpha. The whole geom point. The geoms oh. are not in the. This is function. yeah. This is it's a is it separate one and geom point is like separate. Yes, and the so basically they're just separate functions, but it knows that they're tied together with this plus sign. Um. Yes, um, that's a good question. It gets confusing and the more you practice um, writing out like the syntax of this, you start remembering it. It took me a while, I know. Um, but yeah, you've got your ggplot function and then gm functions, and then you add them together with plus sign. Um, so um, with this gm point, we can change the um, opacity with alpha. And here it's 0.2, so it goes from 0 to 1, so it's 20% opacity, basically. Um, and you can see when there's a ton of dots here, that helps seeing that there's a, you can tell that there's a lot more because you can see how they stack up a little bit better. Um, so you can play around with that. Um, we can also add other attributes like color. Um, so here we've still got our alpha and we can add um, a named color like blue. And these are all going in the geome, so they're affecting how the geome appears. Um, so now points are blue. Um, some other ones that are common to um, add into this um, geome here, you can use size and shape uh, to modify the points. Um, Shape has different options. Size is a number, um, and it's the width in millimeters. Uh, shape has, um, you can choose a number from 1 to 25, and those are just predefined um, um, plotting shapes that are in base R. Um, you can name a shape, um, and there's a link to different options in here, but uh, you can name the shape such as circle or diamond, and then followed by, um, you can just do circle, for example, or you can have it followed by open or filled. And that just depends on, um, it gives you even more things you can modify. So if a shape is open, it's just um, the outline of the shape and you can change the color of the outline. If it's filled, you can change the outline and the filled color. Um, if you were to just do circle, uh, it would all be one color and you can't modify the outline. So you can just play around with that um, to get something that you're looking for, but there's a lot of options and you can see them here. Um, you can also give it a single character in quotation marks um, and it'll plot that character as the point. Um, so you can use a uh, period here and that will make a tiny dot uh, for that character, which is the smallest point that you can kind of get in ggplot. Um, it's like one pixel. Uh, and you can also give it NA and it won't plot any points, um, which 
it's counterintuitive, but sometimes you're adding a lot of other geomes. So you want to make sure it knows that there's a point there, but you're adding other things on top of it to get your plot. Um, yep. Where exactly is this typed in? So in geom plot and then parentheses have alpha color. And then let's say I wanted it to just draw the period, the smallest point that's visible. Okay, so that's just another characteristic you can just add in your geome. So let's try shape. Hitting something. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's where you give it this. Let's see if this works. Okay. So, like, here, we can add shape, you could do size equals and then a number um, shape and then any of those options listed below. So, this is the period. So, you can see you get really small dots for that. Um, so, yeah, you can just keep adding any of those attributes into your geome. Um, and if you go to the help uh, file for a geome point, it'll list um, different attri attribute options and often a lot of examples too. Okay. Um, Um, yeah, so you can try that on your own. So that, that was 1 option is adding shape into there. Um, so you can copy and paste the code from above and try um, changing some of the attributes like shape. Um, you can change your own color, um, or, uh, add a different. Um, what was the other 1 size? Um, so you can try that out here. Okay, so I'm going to try out adding the shape as diamond filled. Um, we have color as blue and I'm also going to do fill as red. Um, so a lot of things going on here and you can really start customizing it. So now we have. Diamonds that are filled with red outlined in blue. Um, mm -hmm. um, with the color. Do I need to know, like, the word of a color? If it's what if I want to change, like, some of the other like, where? Oh, yeah, you have to, like, click a color in a RGB. We'll, we'll get you stuck here a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. You've got the, the customization good. options. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot of options, a lot of common color names. You can just type in the name. There's like. I'm sure I will. <laughs> there's there's lists of them that you can find online. They're pretty standard. You can also give it a hex code um, inside the quotation mark. So it's really customizable. Um, uh, and this is just like the basics of how you stick it in there. Um, but for the first one, for the integers of the defining plotting oh, characteristics, yeah. what is the like instead of fill or color, what's the thing like, that I put in? Oh, um, so to do this, yeah. Um, so for that, that's just for changing the shape. So that's one of the options for picking a different shape. And there's a list of what each of the numbers are. Um, I don't know offhand. I think like 16 is always the dot, which is the standard, but let's try like. So you just don't put them in quotes. Yes, um, not in quotes, just the number. Yeah, okay. So it's just a shape for this. Yeah, it's just like shapes assigned to the numbers 0 through 25. Okay. So looks like 5. I'm getting a diamond thing. Um, yeah. So there's a, a list that you have to look them up, which is inconvenient. <laughs> uh, that's why this ggplot is more helpful than base R because base R only has those 0 through 25 different points. Okay. Okay. Um, so modifying this. Uh, Sally, um, this is the first challenge. Can you just, I don't yes. think Sarah talked about the solution. Oh, the, I did check, check it. Uh, right. Okay. So within this sandbox, um, you can try writing your own answer. You can start over if you want to um, go back to the starting state of the box. You can run your code um, and then submit answer. Is for the challenges and it'll check 
um, what you've done to give you guidance if it's right or wrong. There's a lot of options in this. So a lot of times it's like here it says it didn't expect the color blue, which clearly we can do that to modify our points. Um, so it kind of just gives you uh, an idea of if your code was right or wrong. Um, sometimes it's more clear if you just don't have the right code, if it's like a more straightforward question, but here there's options, so. Um, and then the solution. And if you click on solution, it'll give you, wait, this is a solution? Oh. So a solution will give you a solution to this challenge to give you an idea of what it's looking for. What if I wanna change the actual size of the points? We'll get into that later. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, so you can do size is one of the attributes and then size, you just give it a number. So like if we do 40 for size, and this is also not in quotations. Oh, hopefully it didn't. Okay, <laughs> so like 40 is, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's just a number um, and we'll have more options for that later too, but yeah, you just use the size equals within that genome. Okay, any other questions? Uh, so that's a basic idea of how to make a plot and add attributes to your um, genome. Um, we can start getting more streamlined here, um, we can uh, pipe in data. So um, there's this tidyverse package with all these other great packages under it, and they all kind of work together nicely. Um, so within tidyverse, there's also this McGrid R, I don't know how to say that package, but um, it comes with a function that's called a pipe, and it's percent sign. Um, greater than and another percent sign. Uh, and this is sort of a function itself, sort of like the plus sign. Um, and what that does is it takes whatever object you're working with and passes that into the next function as the first parameter. So this is really nice when you're using ggplot um, and data wrangling. Um, so what you can do is we've got our surveys data set and instead of adding that in the data parameter since in the ggplot function. Um, since data is the first thing in there, we can just pipe this into ggplot. So we have surveys, then pipe. Um, and the shortcut on your keyboard is control shift M. So you don't have to always type those out. It does not base R. Um, there's also the equivalent now uh, in an update, there's a pipe in base R. It works a little bit differently, um, but we're going to stick to the tidyverse version. Um, so surveys piped into the ggplot function, um, and now we don't have to include the data equals surveys, because that's what this is doing. Um, and then, so you just skip to the next parameter in there, which is the mapping and your variables. Um, so we can run this and it does the exact same thing as if we said data equals surveys. Yeah. So yeah, that, it's super useful because then you can do surveys piped into, um, summarize it with a different function and do other things to it and then send it right into ggplot um, instead of having to create new objects or it's just streamlined as saying, take this and then do this and then do this with the pipe. Um, so, um, we can keep, um, adding things to our plot. Um, so we've got our surveys and the same, uh, variables and creating GM points. We're making scatter plot, same alpha. Um, and so now what we can do instead of having color equal something like blue and having all the points be the same color, we can give it a, another variable instead. So it adds another dimension to the plot. Um, and because we wanna give it a variable instead of a constant, we're gonna tell it that it changes throughout the plot by putting it in the AES aesthetic function. So color is still going into our geom point, um, but we're gonna tell it that 
uh, it's going to be a varying aesthetic, and then we're going to give it species ID, which is the name of another variable in the data set. Okay, um, so the points are still um, semi transparent from alpha, and now the color changes with species ID. Um, and it gives us a key automatically over here, a legend. Um, so it tells us these are each of the different categories of species ID and it gives each one a different color. And then because these points also have alpha of 0.2, the key also has them with alpha of 0.2. So it's kind of hard to see like that, even though that's how you might want it in your plot. So you can change that by including this line of code that we have listed here. Um, and that just makes it so that only in the legend that these are not um, semi-transparent, so you can see the colors better. Um, so this is just sort of like another layer that you add with a plus sign. Um, so another layer of your plot where you're modifying just the legend. Um, okay. Um, Um, and so now uh, we can, um, another trick is we have this with our geom point because we want to change the point colors. We can also include things like um, color, size, shape, we can also go directly in the ggplot part of this um, with the other aesthetics. So we have this AES with X and Y. Um, we can also add that color equals species ID into the aesthetic part of that um, here instead of with our geom point. And this will do the same thing in this case. Um, but then how this is different, instead of including it with geom point, is that anything included in your ggplot function instead of your geom functions, um, the ggplot ones are global aesthetics. And if you add it to a geom, it's a local aesthetic. Um, so this is, Kind of confusing, but it's really nice for customization because you can get it to do um, different things. So, for example, um, here we have color um, within this aesthetic function because this is a variable, not a constant. So, we have this in the global part of it with a ggplot function. Um, and so, what that does is it applies this to anything that follows all geomes that you add to your plot this color equals species ID applies to it. Let me try that. Um, so it creates uh, this other geome here, add smoothing lines. Um, and so color is also applied to each of those smoothing lines, even though we didn't put color in either of these geomes, it's global, so it applies color to anything that follows. Um, and then as far as local aesthetics, um, you can kind of see the effects here of um, uh, if it's a geome, it, uh, let's see. So a global aesthetic, it does to all of the geome. So it's making a smoothing line for each of these groupings. Um, and if we don't have it as a global aesthetic and we put it, um, Um, we only have it here in the points. It doesn't apply it to everything. So geom smooth is just for all the data. Not and it doesn't know anything about your separate species IDs because that's only applied to your um, points. Which here it's changed to jitter. That's the same as points, except for it um, adds a little bit of noise so that they're not overlapping as much. Um, but this would do the same thing with point. So when it's local, you have to do aesthetic and then color equals species ID, where if you're doing it globally, you just say, you don't have to do the aesthetic parentheses. Uh, it depends. So basically the aesthetic, just think about, is it a constant? So if color equals blue, we don't need the aesthetic, either if it's global or local. We can add color globally. Um, not being an aesthetic. Let's see what happens. Blue. So this is not an aesthetic. Um, so it's just a constant and it's global. 
Um, and so that applies to all of our geomes, except for we also have a color here. So it uh, overrode that for the point. Um, you add the aesthetic when your um, whatever you're specifying, color, size, whatever, if it's a variable and it changes throughout the plot, that's when you have the aesthetic function around it. So there's the aesthetic part, having that function, so constant or a variable, and then there's global or local. So do you want it to apply to all of your geomes, which here we just have two. Um, you put it in your ggplot function up here, or if you just want it to apply to just one of those things, you put it in just one of your geomes. Um, yeah, does that help? I know this, this part's a little confusing. <laughs> um, yeah, there's the global, the local, constants and variables. So. It's just on the on the little box under globally. Um, yes. Like before it's changed, it has color. It just has color equal species ID. Oh, it is still in. Okay. It's harder to tell because there's other things in there too, but it is still in this aesthetic. Okay. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so you can add multiple things in your aesthetic. They don't each need its own little aesthetic parentheses. That so. makes sense. Yes. <laughs> no, that's a good question. This part's a little confusing, but it really helps with customization. So just playing around with where you put things um, can help you get to what you want. Um, okay. And we're going to do just that. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So we have some challenges. Um, so you can type in this question mark geome point to get the help file for um, it brings up, up the help file for geome point. So it, it lists different aesthetics you can use, which we've gone over um, a few of them, like alpha, color, fill, size. Those are all aesthetics. Um, and so now we want to uh, kind of create the same plot. And now, um, instead of using species ID, pick some other variable in the data set and have it change. So it could be um, maybe the size changes with year or something. So just pick uh, a variable and a, an aesthetic and see what kinds of plots you can make. So you can try that out. Let's see. So something I'm trying out is I'm still using the color aesthetic. Um, but this time I'm going to use the plot ID variable and see what that gives me. And I'm just having it locally in this jitter, which is jittered points or scatter plot. So um, we can see that plot ID is a bunch of different numbers and it changes the color, but it puts them on a gradient. I'm also going to change the alpha according to what sex uh, the rodents are. See what that does. So now it gives us two different legends for um, our different aesthetics that we've made. So um, it assigns a different value of alpha to each of the sexes. So um, female is sort of uh, pretty transparent. So we can mostly just see the males here. Um, yeah, maybe let's try a little more. Um, And these are all variables, so they're all in this um, AES function. Uh, this variable cannot be mapped to shape a set. Oh. Um, 
So So shape is expecting um, different, like a list of different shapes, but year is a number. So here I'm telling it to treat each year as a different category. So now it assigns a different shape for each year. Um, so you can highlight whatever you want on your plot by giving it different um, aesthetics to pull out different features. Um, and then this challenge part two is sort of what I was already doing. Um, so create a scatter plot of weight over uh, plot ID. So now we're gonna still have weight on the X or um, we'll have a scatter plot, but it'll be weight and plot ID instead of hind foot length. Um, and then different plot types shown in different colors. So change the map roots. So um, weight on the y axis and plot ID on the x axis and I'm just going to do a scatter plot and not do a smoothing line for this. And we want um, different plot types shown in different colors. Um, what is plot type? Let's try this. Okay. Um, so, uh, so scatter plot for these two things, plot ID and weight are both, uh, quantitative variables. So you can plot it like this here. The jitter really helps because if you just had point, um, there'd be a lot of overlap because the plot IDs are just numbers given to distinct plots. Um, and we can see it's coloring those plot IDs on a gradient from zero to 20 something. Um, so this might not be the most effective plot for plotting this plot ID variable because it's a number, so you can use it in a scatter plot. Um, but it's really just sort of an arbitrary number to give to a category, a categorical plot for which plot it is. It doesn't really matter which number it is. Um, so lining them up like this doesn't always make the most sense. So um, in this case, we want to split up our weights by categories um, instead of across the range of uh, plot ID numbers. Um, so we're gonna do that. Um, so now we still have, um, so we have another category species ID, um, which is also, uh, a, uh, that was not a number, but it's also categorical. And then we have weight again, and instead of having a scatter plot, we're going to use um, geom box plot to make box plots. So we still have the weights on the y axis, but now for each of the different categories, it has its own box. Um, so it's easier to compare than something like this. Um, and you can get an idea of where the majority of points are based on like the center line is the uh, median. Um, so you can compare each of the groups. Um, box plots are not always the best though, because um, you can't really see how many points are where. Um, it's sort of a generalization. So we can add, um, um, so we can add in our specific points on top of these to get a better idea of what's going on with our data. So we have our box plot, um, and we're doing alpha zero here to get rid of the outliers that appear with our box plots. Um, and then we're adding another geom on top of that with our points themselves. And so we still have our box plots and you can see where all of the data lies within that for each category. Um, one thing you might notice is that there's so many points for some of these that you can't see the box plot at all. 
Um, and so here's where thinking about ggplots in terms of layers is helpful because you can switch the order of layers and it'll plot them differently on top of each other. Um, so let's change the order of this, see if that helps. So we're gonna do ggplot and then we're gonna add our points layer plus, and then add our box plot layer and get rid of our extra plus sign. And now, because of the order that we put those in, the box plots came last, so they go on top of the points. So it's easier to see what's going on. Okay, um, got some more challenges. You guys can try some of this out. Um, so we have box plots and we have adding points um, to help show us what's going on with the data. Um, but we also can do violin plots, which helps show the distribution of the data a little bit better than a, a box. Um, so this is the same plot as above, and instead of box plot, you can try out um, violin. Spell them. Um, and for a violin plot, um, this alpha equals zero, it doesn't show outliers or not, so you can get rid of this if you want. It won't do anything in this case. And we can't see it because of the order. Okay. And you can see the violin plots here are sort of similar. You can see the distribution, but you can see that they are wider where there's more points. Um, and some of them you can see are very stretched out because they have such a wide range of values. Um, yeah, so a lot of times this gives you a little bit even better idea of what your data looks like. Um, and this part, oh, I was supposed to do it down here. Um, but yeah, this is what you would get. Um, okay. Um, so we've looked at weight and species ID. Um, so we can try making one with hind foot length and species ID. Um, and box plot or violin plot? Uh, it says box plot. So you could try either one and see what the differences are. Um, so try a different Y variable instead of weight. Okay, cool. So, yeah, um, with the violin plot, um, when you try hind foot length, you can see that there's a lot of uh, variability in these distributions that wouldn't be super obvious with a box plot. Um, we can see what box plots look like. Oh, I changed the. Well, this is a good comparison. You can see that the box plots are really similar in red, but you get more detailed violin plots. Um, so yeah, playing around with different GM options can get you, get you some interesting results or good comparisons. Um, add color to your points um, based on the plot that they came from. Let's see. So I'm gonna recreate sort of base plot with hind foot length. Okay, and then um we want to change the color of the points, so our geom jitter, um, according to plot ID. So now instead of a solid color, we want this to vary with plot ID. Oops. Um, let's put this all inside. Okay. 
color equals black pretty um, private. I spelled it wrong. So. Okay. Um, so we have file ends on top of this. We have um, the color is by plot ID, but as I mentioned, this is um, numeric, but it's just sort of um, numbers given to categories. So it's kind of confusing to see it this way. Um, so if this, if plot ID was a character instead, how would it look different? So you can uh, go back to your survey data set and create a new, um, a new variable where plot ID is a character or just a quick way to do it with only within your plot is just add the function to this variable. And now um, it treats it as a categorical variable with numbers as names. Um, so still kind of hard to see in this case. And then just to illustrate a little bit further about um, how different types of geomes can get you different types of results, um, there is this data set uh, from the package data Saurus. Um, and they illustrate that you can have um, box plots that look exactly the same, but they're very different distributions of data. Um, so they have five different cases here and um, if we just look at the box plots. So I'm gonna comment out these other ones. Oh, so there's more modifications in here. So, very different data, but the box plots all look exactly the same. Um, and you can add violin plots on top of that. And we can see the violin plots are um, somewhat different. You can start to see those differences. And then adding in the points themselves, you can really get, oh, I forgot a plus sign. Have an extra plus on. So you can really get an idea of how each of these are different from each other. Uh, the more aesthetics and geomes you add in. Um, right. So, yes. Uh, can you go real quick back up to the challenge before that? Mm -hmm. I don't understand the as.character for oh. plot ID. Yeah, okay. So uh, this one where I added this. Yeah. Um, so plot ID um, is a class. Uh, surveys. Plot ID. Um, so we can check what type of variable this is uh, with class. And it's a numeric variable. And so that's why when we plot it without this as character part, it's treating this as numeric. So it thinks it's a, a range of continuous values from zero to 25 ish. Um, and so it's just that the higher the value, the lighter the point is. Um, but plot IDs are really just categories. Um, even though we gave them numbers. So adding, um, oops. So here we're just doing as character to change the type of variable it is gotcha. as character. So if we do that here and check the class. Um, Sally's also doing a shortcut in R. If you highlight something and then do open parenthesis, it will automatically do the closed parenthesis. So you don't have to find, you don't have to tab over or space over or whatever to get to the end of whatever you want to enclose. Interesting. Oh, yeah. 
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, shortcuts I didn't realize I use on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, so if we do that as character and put our numeric variable in there and then check the class, um, let's try this. It now knows that it's a character variable, um, and so it's treating one as uh, a piece of text or a name instead of um, a quantitative variable. So then in the plot, it doesn't think that there's values like 0.5 somewhere in there. It knows that these are each distinct categories, okay. even though they're given numbers. Um, and that affects how it's plotted, which it's still hard to see because there's so many categories here, but yeah. So can we remove that as character now? Now that it's already. Oh, no. So, um, if we remove it here, it will still go back to being numeric. Um, here, we're just checking it. Um, so, you can use, should I illustrate the button <laughs> here? <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to take up too much time. It, it's super practical. So, like, um, it, you can also change it in your data set here. It's changing it only in your plot. So, if you remove the as character. Um, it'll go back to being numeric um, because you haven't actually modified the variable in your data set. Um, but you can mutate plot ID and character. Um, plot ID. So um, here you're taking your spaces out. This is just checking what it is. This has it stored in your data set. So you're taking you're taking surveys, your data set, and passing that into the mutate function to change one of your variables. Um, so we're changing plot ID and we're replacing it with uh, the character version of plot ID, and then we're taking that and putting it into ggplot. So now we can get rid of this. And it'll do the same thing. Um, so that's where the pipes are really nice because you can modify things in your data set and then not have to modify them in your plot code. Now that, that modification is still just local to this particular pipeline or chain of events. Um, if you want it to persist, um, you need to. So here we can. So now we can. This is the modified one, and we can store it back over the top of itself. We do that. Oops. Oh, it just ran. Um, so now it's saved, um, and we can just give it the surveys data set with our modified data, and now that will also. Remember, so a few different ways to do it. Yeah, does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So uh, I'm going to jump to the next thing now. Um, so that's sort of the basics of how you can create plots and modify them. Um, and we just looked at scatter plots with two quantitative variables and um, box plots with a quantitative and a categorical variable. But what if you just want to look at one variable at a time? Um, there's different plotting options we can use for that. Um, so we can look at one quantitative variable. So we were looking at weight before. Um, but what if you just want to know like the distribution of all your weights um, across all your variables? You have your whole data set. What are all the different weights I've collected? Um, so you can do that with something similar to a violin plot. The violin plot showed the density, um, but we're just going to do that for with no groupings. Um, so we have our data set. Um, we're going to pipe that into ggplot and tell us tell it what variables we want it to plot. And we're just looking at one variable. So we're giving it x equals weight. And then we're going to use geom density. And this shows us um, how all of our weights across this one variable are distributed. Looks like there's a lot of low values. 
and very few higher values around 100, 200. Um, and it's sort of not satisfying because there's, it's just this line. Um, it might look like a time series or something. So we can also go back to changing aesthetics and fill this in. So same plot that we have above, and now we're gonna add fill and pick a color, um, sky blue, and add that into our geome. And it fills that in, so you can tell that uh, this is a density plot rather than a time series or something else. Um, Instead of density, can you have a count? Um, I don't think that is a geome, but you can get, let's see, I think that's actually Getting to our next thing here, you're leading right into a histogram, uh, which is perfect. So um, this is where, uh, depending on what variables variables you have, I really like the ggplot cheat sheet because it'll tell you how many do you have of a quantitative variable. Do you have two quantitative, one quantitative, a quantitative, a categorical, and it'll give you all the different geomes that you might be able to use with that, and you have different plotting options. Um, so another option besides density. Um, if you want the count or frequency, we can use histogram, which is super common. And same thing, geome histogram instead of geome density, um, and we have count. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, perfect question. Um, so it shows that, and then it comes with an interesting message here. Um, with histogram, and this does not appear when you use a base R histogram. Um, gives you a little bit more information or tips for your plot. Uh, says uh, using bins equals 30, uh, pick a better value for with bin width. So it's saying here that it's automatically guessing how many of these bars or bins um, that it's putting on your histogram. Uh, but there might be a different value that uh, summarizes your data better. So um, challenge four is asking you to try out some different um, bin numbers or bin widths. You can actually do both. So you can do like bin, um, you can have like two bins. And what does that give you? Maybe it's what you want, maybe not. Um, you can also do bin width. Um, and so let's try like bin width equals one. And this is how big each bin is. So I spelled it wrong. It tell, so here it gives me a warning that it doesn't know what bin width is. So figure out how to spell it. Okay, so bin width equals one. So it tells you um, each of these bins is just one number wide. So like um, from zero to one, one to two, et cetera. Um, so you can use either one to modify how many bins you have, um, and there's not really a right answer. You just get different details from your data. Um, so smaller bins, you can see more detail. Um, wider bins, you get a more general picture um, and can maybe summarize in fewer words what's going on with your data. So um, you can play around with those, see what you get. And I'm going to pass it to Greta. Thank you, Sally. Yeah. Need a break. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, awesome. yeah, it is after. Um, do we want to um, keep pressing on or do we want to take a five minute break? Five minutes. Okay, five minute break. <laughs> um, Four twelve. Okay. <laughs> and the bathrooms are just right up that way. If you, need. I think water is out that way too.
wait until 412 since that's what Sarah said, just in case anybody that was online um, isn't back yet. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, so I get to talk about the fun stuff. So Sally was doing really important stuff. Um, but when we have categorical variables, we can really color things and have the colors make sense. And so it'll lead into what Ava is going to talk about about um, customizing things a little bit. Um, however, categorical variables are a little bit more complicated to work with, which is why we put them here and not at the beginning. Um, so let's just start really naive um, and we're going to pick species ID um, as our variable to work with. We're going to, uh, we want to have a categorical representation of that and a, um, a typical representation as a bar chart. Um, you can techn technically do bars or calls. So bars or, um, or columns. Um, it, it changes how it works with a little bit different. It's not not as not as simple as like which direction that they go. Um, so we're going to have vertical bars um, since we're giving it an x attribute or um, x variable, and then geom bar. And let's see what happens. And we get um, counts frequencies of all the different species with their short two letter codes, um, and. Um, the species ID is sorted alphabetically, um, and um, with a little bit of work, you can make this into a Pareto chart where it's sorted in um, decreasing order of frequency, um, but by default, you're going to get um, just alphabetical order of your species and these gray bars. Okay. So how do we actually get these bars? Uh, like I said, it's more complicated than just plotting values uh, because we have to do some summarization to get those values. So the first thing that R does under the hood uh, is that it looks at the entire data frame and then it's counting um, each of the, um, so it's using the variable that you give it and seeing how many observations of that variable you have and then the count statistic returns a data frame that is the species ID with um, the number of each of those observations. Uh, and then it's um, taking that table or data frame and plotting it. So you could do it by hand and you could give it, a, you know, an already summarized table with the counts in it. Um, but the genome bar is doing all of that behind the scenes. Um, so because it's doing a statistic or an aggregation behind the scenes, you could use, uh, instead of geom bar, you could use stats count um, as a layer for a ggplot, and that will actually do the same thing. So instead of saying, um, draw me, geom, draw, draw me a bar chart, you could say, give me the summarized counts, stat count, um, in a ggplot, which is a bar chart. Uh, and um, so if we wanted a bar chart of proportions instead of frequencies or counts, we would um, use a modifier that after we calculate this counts, we want a proportion. So now our y-axis, instead of being counts, we want to modify that after the statistics are calculated and we want proportions, which is shortened to prop. Um, and then we have this extra parameter group equals one, and we'll talk about that in um, the challenge. But for the time being, just accept that we need to have group equals one in there and let's see what happens. The plot looks almost exactly the same. The only difference is on the y-axis. Instead of frequencies, we now have proportions. Okay, so why do we need this group equals one in the proportion bar chart? So um, let's just take it out and see what happens. 
what happened? They're all at 100 or 1% or yeah, total, uh, the proportion is 100%. Um, so why is it 100? Why are they all 100%? When we're calculating the proportions, this one is using each group as the denominator. So it's counting how many in a group divided by how many in the group, right? So when we use, when we do group equals one, what is it using as the denominator? Not one, but it's using all of the groups. So the total across all of the groups as the denominator for each group. So this will be important or that it's important to make sure that you do that because if you want a proportion bar chart, um, really this is what you want, right? You don't, you want it out of the total, not out of each group. Um, when we do stacked and colored bar charts though, um, having it be the proportion out of the column is probably what you want. So let's add another variable. And um, we're going to have species ID um, colored by species ID, and um, we're just going to do a bar chart. So um, we have one variable, we're coloring by the same variable, maybe not super interesting, but let's just see what happens here. Uh, okay, color probably didn't do what you expected, right? What did color do? The outline, right? What did we really want? The inside. Um, so we want to change this code so that the inside, oh, I already have the code copy there. The inside is a different color. Uh, what's the synonym for inside? Interior. Interior. <laughs> Sorry? Fill. Fill, yes. So color is the outline, um, uh, mostly because a lot of geomes, you know, it, it just doesn't really have a concept of an outside or an inside, and we'd, so we just think of color. Um, and then fill anything that's got an inside, such as shapes, um, fill gets you the color on the inside. But still, we probably, uh, you know, this, this could make a good presentation, right? If you're giving a presentation um, and somebody's at the back of the room, Having the different bars be different colors might be important. So maybe it's not trivial to just have the um, same variable here for that what's plotted and what's colored based on it. Uh, all right, sorry, I did that. Um, but uh, going back to that group, a stacked bar chart, um, maybe we want to figure out the proportion um, of males and females within each species. Right, and so what we're going to do is now we're going to color or fill based on the second variable. Um, and so we're going to try this out. We're going to do it two different ways. Um, actually, I'm just going to uh, highlight and run the top part here. Uh, we're still plotting species ID on the x-axis, but we're filling based on sex of the rodents. And um, this is a frequency chart. Uh, so they're not necessarily comparable between bars, but we can see within a bar the proportion of males and females. Um, and so this is stacked, but maybe we want side by side bar charts. Uh, I'm not sure why, but um, side by side we give that or we get that by saying position equals dodge. So we're going to dodge the or offset the bars. And if we run that one, I'm actually going to run both of them at the same time. So again, stacked and bars. Now it's a little bit easier to compare males and females, but again, it's not comparable um, across the whole uh, chart because it's counts and not proportions. And so if we um, go back to this first one, let's see what happens if we change this from um, position or take this one, instead of saying position equals dodge, let's say um, we say position equals fill and then see what happens there. 
we actually got proportion, we got the proportion chart. Now having um, the them all total to 100% makes sense, right? And now you can compare that even though we couldn't see that before, um, this species here is actually a higher proportion of females compared to males, even though they're just low counts altogether for that particular species. Um, it did not fix the y-axis label. It's not actually a count, it's a proportion, right? So we would have to modify that um, later when we change the labels to make sure that that is a, a correct um, and, I, and informative y-axis label and we'll also change the x-axis label, okay? Any questions about plotting a single categorical variable technically or plotting two categorical variables here? Let's talk about time series data. Uh, so we're gonna actually count some things first so that we're not just doing things under the hood. Um, we're gonna think about this deliberately. Um, and this is a little preview of what we would get in data wrangling. So if we want to look at how the counts change over time, we need to know what the counts are over time. So we're going to take the survey's data set. Um, we're going to count how many observations we have for each year and each genus. Um, I'm not a biologist. Um, I know that genus is going to be a higher level of classification, I hope, than the species IDs. Um, uh, so we have fewer categories. Uh, I could be wrong about that, though. So let's see what we get. Okay. So we have, um, it's and it's sorting it based on the first one that we gave it. So it's sorting based on year and then based on genus. And then we're getting all the counts and we can see that we've got six pages of results. If you were doing this in our studio, it would look different. Um, this shiny app kind of gives it a nice web friendly table. Uh, but we could go to six and we could see that it goes all the way to 2002 um, and Sigmodon um, is the last genus for this. So now let's visualize this. Uh, we save this information into yearly counts, so technically yearly species counts, but we're just going to keep it short. With yearly counts, we're going to pass that into ggplot. Uh, on the x-axis, we'll put year, and then we're just going to very naively put the counts on the y-axis, so y equals n. This new variable that was created when it counts it was named n by default. And um, we want a time series. Time series are lines. So we're just going to say, give me geome line. Let's see what happens. Um, we got a very nice zigzaggy plot. That's probably not very informative. Uh, it's trying to connect too many dots. Um, we can't really see what's going on there, right? Um, so. That's because we plotted all the data for all the genera together. So we need to tell ggplot to draw a line for each genus. Um, this time we're going to not color on it, so we're just going to group on it. So we're going to say group equals genus. And then let's see what happens. So we're just adding that to the global aesthetics so that it'll apply to everything after and then running genome line. All right, um, we're del very deliberately building this up step after step because um, we want to really drive home the fact that all, a lot of these aesthetics really matter in order to be able to tell a story, okay? So now this is better. It's not all zigzaggy. It makes sense. You know, we can kind of follow the trends, but um, it's hard to pick out, you know, which line goes where. Does it, is this line one species? Or does it do a very sharp corner and go up? Uh, with them all being the same color, we can't really tell. So what we're going to do is, um, while group works to get different lines for each um, genus, we actually do want to use color there instead, um, because that 
groups and colors all at the same time. And when we do that, we can see that it didn't really have that sharp corner, um, uh, that it was the first option that I gave where it swoops down. Uh, and um, we do see that we have the genus is a much shorter list than the species ID, uh, it's grouping some of the species together. And some of them, uh, some of the genuses are way more common than other ones. And then some weren't even observed in some of the years, like Sigmodon wasn't observed uh, before 1997. All right, any questions about that? So geome line connects the dots. So that's like a dot to dot, right? Um, we were talking about, um, Geome line versus geome smooth. If you want to give it all of the data and then just try to find trend lines, that's what you want to use geome smooth for. If you just want to connect dots, then you'd want to use geome line. Um, there's also geome segment if you want to have disconnected lines or if you want to have, if you want to create like a step plot or a stair plot, then you'd want to use geome segment where you give it a start and an end and um, a constant value, and then it won't try to connect all of the dots. Uh, okay, so all this information in one plot is very interesting. However, maybe we want a single plot for each of these species, but we wanna visualize them in a comparable format, and we don't wanna to have to create uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight plots. All right, we don't want to do that by hand. So if we facet, we can take one plot and um, split it into multiple plots based on a variable, and it will do it auto, um, automat uh, automatically or automagically. Um, and so we just have to make a decision about how we want to create all the facets. Do we want it to do it completely automatically? where it just picks how many are going to be in each row and each column, or do we want to be very deliberate and say, I want exactly this many in um, each row or in each column. So facet wrap just sequences them to fit cleanly on a page um, and it'll keep going and it'll leave some blank spots. Facet grid will either put all of them in one row, all of them in one column, or you can say, um, that you want three columns or three rows and so on. So this is another layer to the um, the GG plot. So if we if we take this um, plus and the last part off, we had exactly what we had before. Um, the really gross, zigzaggy, can't tell the difference between everything. Um, if we, oops. Start over and keep that facet wrap function. And we technically don't need this facets part. We're going to run it with it and then I'll take it off. Facets equals tilde. Tilde in R means by. So we want to facet by genus. And so now we get one line or one plot for each genus. Um, and notice that the scale on the y axis is consistent across all of them so that we get comparable plots. Same thing, the consistent, the x axis is consistent across all of them, and it only has enough x axes that make sense. So we don't need to have an x axis for these four plots and this one here um, because we can read below. Um, let's, if we take out this facets equals part and just have tilde genus, we get the same thing. Okay. So the facets equal is just being more deliberate and being more careful about specifying things. All right, now let's say we want to have um, another facet. So we want to, or we want to split each line by the sex of the rodent captured. And um, to do that, we need counts of year, species ID, and sex. So we're going to have yearly sex counts, surveys count, and so all three of those that we're going to count, 
and we'll get a much longer table because now we're going to have um, for each sex that was observed, we're going to have counts for each species. And this is also species ID instead of genus. So we're going to get more information, smaller counts. So we have 15 pages now. And some of the counts are pretty small. Let's visualize this. So we're going to uh, color by sex. So we're going to have two lines in each plot, one for males, one for females. And then we're going to facet by species ID. And um, some of the some of the plots, it's a little bit easier to tell the difference between males and females. And other ones, it's harder to tell the difference. So that's starting to tell a story already. And this is again using facet wrap, so it's picking how many it plots where. Uh, we can also do facet wrap, but tell it that we only want one column. So n columns is number of columns. So we have one column of all those plots, makes it kind of hard to read. Uh, we could do one row with all of those columns. And it squishes them in, makes them really skinny plots. Um, or we could do facet grid. And um, in this time, we're going to uh, facet grid. We can give it an X, vari or X variable and a Y variable. So we're going to give it um, something to facet by our own rows and something to facet by our own groups. Let's see what happens here. Um, so it's sex by species ID. So sex is the like the Y or the vertical facet, and species ID would then be like the X axis. Um, and so we can see that there's actually two plots here. Let's, um, I'm going to steal some of Ava's thunder here. Make this a little bit easier to see. Okay, so now we can definitely see we've got a facet, a vertical facet, as well as the horizontal facet. All right, so challenge seven. Use what you learn to create a plot that depicts how the average weight of each species changes through the years. Play around with which variable you facet by uh, versus plot by. And so uh, we've got to get you started. We have the code to um, summarize to get the average weight over all the years and species. And then so you'll use yearly species weight to play around with. Um, Fastening by uh, and um, plotting by. So you have to modify this. Um, so we want average weight over time. So we want year on the x axis. And average weight. So you can see. We change the n to average weight and we color by species ID. Um, we can, uh, we have um, the coloring is not necessarily, not, it's not necessary. However, it kind of makes things a little bit more interesting visually. We can see how the weights change over time. Uh, we can put in, um, let's see here. Mm -hmm. 
can change the color over years. Um, let's see, what else would I play around with? Oh, and then the other one, the other part of the solution is to just take out the um, faceting. And see what happens if we don't facet by it. Um, then we just get a bunch of spaghetti lines. Um, it might be a little bit hard to read. Any questions about that? Ava is going to, um, I previewed theme dark a little bit. Ava is going to talk a little bit more about colors and themes. And then um, I'll pop back and talk about how we can get a little bit more control over arranging plots and exporting plots if we have time. Guys, so really cool stuff with drafts. Basically, everything you see up here can be customized. And that's going to happen through just this theme command. Um, and you're going to see this pop up. It's always just going to be a base of just theme parentheses. And so if you see here, you can go theme underscore blank, and it will change the background. So we can try a few different ones. Like we could do theme underscore minimal. And that will change how it looks visually. So it doesn't just always affect the color. Sometimes it does actually affect the layout of the graph as well. So yeah, and then this first link here is a complete list of all the themes under ggplot. So if you ever want to explore that, that is there. Um, and then the second graph here is going to kind of send you to a public library where it basically has a bunch of already coded different themes and different graphs. So if you have a set of data and you don't want to completely build your own graph from scratch, that is a great place to start. Or if you make a super cool graph, you can also upload it to there for other people to try out, which is super awesome. Um, perfect, yeah, so just try using your graph from Challenge 7 and messing with the themes a little bit. Does anyone have any questions with that? Is it working? Awesome. Perfect. And then on to more customization, you can change all the labels on your plots. Um, this is used, this is done using the labs function. Um, so basically you do labs parentheses and then anything you want to add a specific title to, you'll specifically outline and just assign it a value. Um, so you can see here that we're name. We can be a lot more specific with the names of our variables on our graphs. As well, if you're having a really long um, title, you can wrap it. So like, let's say I want to call this "Observe Species Through Time in Gallatin Valley." by an MSU student, right? Kind of long. Um, we can do a backslash N and that should break that up for us. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, so if you ever have a giant title, no fear. Great, and then you can also 
mess around with the fonts. ggplot comes with a really basic package of various plots, um, but you can go in and download this extra font package and it gives you a lot to choose from. This is just done by adding um, Sorry, uh, this is done by adding. Wait, where is this actually? So it's not actually changing the font. It's just okay. changing the size. To the oh, this one's just for the size. Okay, sorry. Yes, this graph is not for fonts. This is for size. Um, so you'll see that if you want to change the size of your of your text, um, it is done by this command here. This does, however, change all of the text for your graph. Um, and so if you want to do that, it's perfect. But if you want to have a little bit more function, like a little bit more specification, we'll get into that later. Um, and so something that will help make our graph more readable is flipping our X axis variables. So they are vertical. And that is done by the command chord flip. So you can see that we just put that at the bottom with a little plus mark and that will flip our coordinates. Any questions? Okay. Will you scroll up to the graph yes. before that, before they were flipped? Yes. Okay, and then will you scroll down? Because it looks like the graph themselves are flipped, but the numbers are still Oh, yes. Horizontal. Sorry. So um, it flips the coordinates by like rotating the entire graph, I guess. Um, so it does actually change the graph. This isn't just um, rotating, rotating the label. Text. There are commands to do that. I do not know specifically how to do that off the top of my head right now. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, I'll flip the flip the axes, and then this is how we change the text size for each element of the plot. Um, you want to make sure you're kind of hitting all of all of the title or like all of the titles, so they all get customized. Um, but this is just a really basic X, Y title legend, and you can play around with the sizes, and it should make it look a little bit nicer, something like that. And then you can also change the position of the legend by adding the function legend position into your themes function. Um, so if you do just do that at the very bottom, you can move it around. And so yeah, we just move it from the side to the top here. And then something else you can do to kind of help with visuality um, is to remove grid lines. Um, so this is what it looks like after Removing the grid lines, the code that did this is going to be um, this chunk right here. So you can see if we take this out. Oop. Close your fantasy. Plus. What's an extra comma? Oh God! Yeah, no, it's it's the the um, at, at the end of the theme. At the end of theme, the hashes need to be removed. Oh, no, not that one. Just oh, this one. Perfect. Sorry, I'm new to this, guys. <laughs> it's fun to watch the puppetry team. Yeah, yeah. Um. So when I did that last time, it it removed them. But okay. you, I think there's just an extra comma, right? Uh, at the very, um, it's okay. Okay, so yeah, yeah. But yeah. if we, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, yes. Okay, hopefully that should. Oh, I don't know. So usually it will be a lot more visually visual, more visually busy. Um but you can set them to element blink to make them disappear. Um, yeah, so you use axis line to declare what colors that X and Y axis should be. Panel grid major to remove major grid, um, which are the ticks between the X and Y axis, or like associated between the X and Y axis. 
and panel grid miner to remove the miner grid, panel border to remove the border around the plots, and panel background to to kind of alter the background, take away the background. Uh, but you can also do this with the theme functions, like theme minimal or theme dark or theme black and white. Um, so you can really play around if your data is ever not looking adequate or not standing out properly. And then getting a little more into changing the colors, um, you can use scale color manual or scale fill manual functions to add to your plot. Um, so we're going to define these vectors with a bunch of different hex codes. Um, so we're defining palette gray uh, with this gray code and then several others, and then palette black with black and then several others. And you'll see when we run this with two different graphs, it'll give us two graphs, one with um, gray points and one with black, black points. So if our background was to, were to be black, we have a clear option. Um, and yeah, so it kind of just helps with visuality. And you can install other packages to bring in more colors to RStudio, but just be aware when you do that, you are going to have to change, slightly change the commands you're using based off the name. Um, but these are just most common color packages. And so, yeah, with all this information, try customizing your graphs. Or does anyone have any questions before they get started? And I'll have it, hand it back to Greta. Let's see what her solution is here. So um, you can um, look at the solution. Uh, that we provided and we can see that you've got some lots of different things going on here. Um, this uh, in the element text angle here is what is going to rotate your label, your axis labels. Um, this H just, if you go at an angle and it's not vertical or horizontal, so if it's not 90 degrees, um, you have to adjust it vertically a little bit or horizontally. And it's actually, if we want to shift it down so that it's not um, going over the <clears throat> x-axis, you actually have to shift it horizontally. <laughs> so it's a little bit counterintuitive, um, but it's just um, a short uh, shift adjusting the horizontal will actually um, do what you need to do. Um, really quickly, arranging plots. There's a couple different packages that help with, um, so faceting uses a variable to lay things out, but if we want a particular plot that has um, different, plots together that's arranged in a nice format so that we can just save a single image to include in a publication. Um, Grid Extra uh, or the Patchwork Package will really help with that layout issues. Um, uh, Cowplot, I think, is another package that helps with layout. I've been using the Patchwork Package more um, than anything else for right now. Um, just because it makes sense to me, um, but I'm also willing to use whatever I need to to get the layout that I want. So let's just try Grid Extra. So we've got, we're going to load the library for Grid, grid Extra. We've got a box plot, um, and then we have a count plot. And so we create those two plots, and we're actually storing them in names so that we can refer to them later. When we store them in variables or objects, 
um, we don't get that. Um, it doesn't show up display until we call that object. Then we're going to use the grid arrange function um, parentheses. The 1st plot that we want the 2nd plot that we want. We want to tell it we want them side by side. So 2 columns. And then we want them to take up varying widths. So the 1st plot will only get. A width of 4 and then the 2nd plot will get a width of 6. And that's probably in percent. So 40% and 60% um, could be inches. A lot of these will scale depending on where you put them in. Um, and so we can see that the, the box plots. Take up, you know, a smaller fraction of the screen and then the. Um, abundance by year plot takes up the rest of it. Um, we would want to tweak this a little bit because the legend isn't completely visible and maybe some of these um, fonts are a little bit too large, but we could work around with playing with some of the options to get those to look a little bit better. We could do the same thing with patchwork uh, using um, that uh, plot one plus plot two, and it knows in this case um, that these are ggplot objects. And when you add two ggplot objects together, if you use the patchwork package, it'll put them side by side. To have one on top of the other, you use a division symbol or a, a slash, forward slash. Patchwork package should be already loaded. And so it'll put one on top of the other. What I really like about patchwork is that if we had plots that had um, a common legend, or they were all colored using the same variable. You can have it just display one legend and it will give it a common legend um, with the plot layout um, feature. We're not going to go into that, but you can learn more about that with the patchwork package. Okay, any layout questions? Um, Actually, I'm going to do. Sorry, you yeah. have to like load that package in before the rest of your code. Um, or just before you want to actually use it. So you could load patchwork right before that. Um, another one that I really like is plot spacer. If you can imagine that you've got an odd number of things that you want to plot, um, plot spacer will give it a blank space. So I'm just going to kind of peek this here. Um, so we're just going to have a bunch of the same plots. And then I'm going to have three on top and three on the bottom, and I'm grouping what I want on top in parentheses, what I want on the bottom in parentheses. And now you can see, we could imagine if we had um, five different plots, right? And we wanted to have some blank spots. We could use plot spacer for that, um, or we can get really fine tuned about where we wanna lay out all of our plots. All right, so we did all this. We're creating all these plots. We want to export them so that we can use them. Um, we would hope that you would be working in your documents, um, you know, like in a markdown file or a Quarto document. Um, if you do that, um, it will automatically put the figures in your document, but it doesn't necessarily export them. And so you still want to make sure that you export them in a certain way. Um, also, there are um, the defaults might not meet um, publication standards for sizing and um, aspect ratios or um, pixels. Um, plot resolution, that's what I want. Um, and so we want to uh, be able to, to do that explicitly. So again, we're gonna save the plot in an object. We're gonna call it my plot. This code doesn't actually run because it won't run on the app or in the, the um, 
uh, um, this environment. Um, but you could copy and paste this code into our studio and it should work. So GG save is the function to export the object out. Uh, we want to give it a path. Um, I always like using relative paths. And so from wherever this document is that you're typing this code, it'll go into the figure folder and then um, call it yearly sex counts dot PNG. You give it your plot name that you saved width and height, or you can specify DPI if that's a requirement of whatever, um, wherever you're putting your figure. And that also works for grid arrange plots um, and patchwork plots as well. Um, and I usually oversize my plots so that whenever I put them in like a PowerPoint, it'll automatically scale them down to be the right size and um, keeps all of the fonts relative to the, the actual size of the figure. Any questions about that before we wrap up? There's a bonus. You can do that at home. Um, these are interactive plots that you know only work if they're in a dashboard or online, um, but you can add in hover text um, and you can turn features on and off. Um, so there's lots of cool things that you can do to play around. Those are in the Plotly um, graphics package. I'm just going to skip over that. Uh, and Sarah, do you want to talk about what's next? Yes. So just thanks for coming. Thanks for sticking it out. Um, I wanted to show you just this next. This page, montana.edu slash data science. And from here, you can click into our training page. So there's workshops, recordings there. Um, we try and update them with the most recent workshop that we've done. And all of the materials are there too. So the tutorials and you can download stuff. And then you can also register for upcoming workshops. So the last one in the series this semester is data wrangling. That is on Wednesday, November 6th, same time, same place. Um, and let us know if you have questions. That's it though. Thank you so much for coming. The data wrangling, we'll get into more details about <clears throat> putting everything in um, a good format. So you either plot it or answer particular questions. Yeah.